Hey guys, Sean here, just putting on my producer hat to apologize for the audio quality this week. Uh, something went wrong with our files, and you're being left with our backups, which, um, well, obviously don't sound as good. So, sorry, and next week we'll be back to the same great quality. Hey, if you're a first-time listener, um, usually it's better, so that's something to look forward to. Thanks, enjoy the show. Hello and welcome to another episode of Ain't It Scary with Sean and Carrie. It's the show where we tackle the unexplained, the unbelievable, the eerie, and the bizarre and, well, try to find an answer. Um, (laughs) We don't always succeed, but we do try. I'm the titular Sean. And I'm the very titular Carrie. And what are we talking about this week, Caroline? Well, I don't know if the audience knows this, but you do. Uh, I was a film major in college. Yes, ma'am. And I still make movies on the side as much as I can, along with my day job and this and everything else that I do. And it's one of my huge, huge passions is filmmaking and film. Um, So I figured for the next couple episodes, I would combine everything spooky with Mm -hmm. everything movie and bring a little two-parter on Hollywood horrors. Ooh, Hollywood horrors. Mm-hmm. So this episode is going to be the first of that two-parter, and we are going to go into cursed films. Okay, cursed films. Uh, what does that... Uh, Carrie, what does that mean? Well, Sean, I can tell you from experience that being on set is a very intense draining emotionally and physically experience. Um, You're there for hours on end, usually standing, waiting around a lot, and then everything's going on at once. It's it's a really stressful place to be. Hurry up and wait, just like television. Mm -hmm. But it also can be really magical. And, you know, movie magic's a real thing. I've written screenplays where once I got on set and I saw the actor's becoming those characters in real life it was a moving experience um so when it comes to film i think there is something inherently magical and otherworldly about it it's like the muppets it's it's the joy of everybody getting together and putting on a show exactly um every every moment and every final product is worth all of the blood sweat and tears that went into making it But sometimes the blood and sweat and tears becomes too literal. Uh Uh-oh. Sometimes the movie magic is overshadowed by something darker and scarier, Sean. Okay. And that's where cursed films come in. So, Sean, do you believe in curses? I think we've known each other long enough for you to answer that question. Well, I want to hear it from you. I do not believe in curses. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I didn't think so. I figured I'd ask. Maybe one of these days the answer will change about any of this stuff. But uh, Unless you mean like fuck and bastard. I believe in <laughs> curse words. No, curses. Uh, the evil eye, for instance, or thinner. Things like that. Yeah, no, not so much. Well, it, it, some people do, Sean. Actually, quite a lot and maybe more than you'd expect. Are we talking about King Tut and Common? What are we what are we talking about? <laughs> well, according to Pew Research Center, 16% of Americans believe in the evil eye or that certain people can cast curses or spells that cause bad things to happen. That's not that high. It seems high for people believing in the evil eye or curses in modern day. But in 2019, YouGov did another poll and similarly found that nearly one in five Americans believe demons definitely exist. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and um, another one in five believing they probably exist. That's what I was going to say. I feel like a lot of people honestly and literally believe in angels and demons. 
In general, more than four in ten Americans believe in ghosts, demons, and other supernatural beings. How many believe in um, Bigfoots? Big feet? Big f- We're going to come back to that later, actually. But uh, I, I didn't get the Bigfoot statistics on this one. But maybe oh, when we you fin- got to find those Bigfoot statistics. <laughs> when we finally do our Bigfoot episode, then those will come in. I have to say our research department dropped the ball on this uh what the fuck, dude? <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. You're, you're our research department. <laughs> Literally the only one. So for these statistics, I was concentrating on researching America because it's easier to get data on uh, one specific country. But these are also all going to be American films. We also make the, the most and the biggest and the best known films. Exactly. Now, these, this set of statistics seemed really high to me, and I'm a believer in at least some of these things. Uh, with 40% of Americans believing in supernatural beings as recently as last year, it kind of feels like we're only getting more out of touch with the paranormal as the years progress, so it seems, it seems high to me. Yeah, 40% believe in it's at some form of the paranormal? Uh, 40 Forty percent, more than forty percent, believing in ghosts, demons, other supernatural beings. So I think that can include something like angels or whatever. Yeah, it is interesting. That's a lot of people. Yeah. So we're going to go through four movies that people have uh, rumored are haunted since basically they came out, and you know, different places will dig up those legends for a Halloween article here and there, but uh, the stories keep keep coming. All right, so sl- so slow down. How is a movie haunted? If I, if I pop it in the VHS player because it's 1996, um, <laughs> is the tape going to come out and strangle me? No, the movie does not haunt us in any way. The movie, especially the sets and things like that, um, the different productions, and even the people involved with making the movie, those are the things that are purported to be cursed or haunted. Ooh. So, like, no craft services one day. The craft (laughs) services were all spoiled. (laughs) That is a true curse if you've ever been on set for 12 hours in a row (laughs) and not having any gummy snacks and uh, granola bars. Those are the big things. You eat like a child when you're on set. Um, I eat like a child all the time. Well, especially when you're on something like an independent film for some reason, and I'm guilty of this as well. People think, oh, everyone wants like fruit roll-ups and we just turn into like moms <laughs> trying to feed children. Mm-hmm. But um, yeah, no craft services would be a bad, bad sign. And I don't think any of these stories get that frightening. <laughs> we'll start with Rosemary's Baby. Oh, so great movie. It is. Rosemary's Baby is a 1968 psychological horror film, and you may remember it stars Mia Farrow and was directed by Roman Polanski, adapted from a blockbuster novel by Ira Levin. No, Roman Polanski. Now, nothing else ever came of him, right? (laughs) We'll get to that in a minute. So the gist of the story, for anyone who may not have seen the movie, is that the titular Rosemary... Not the very titular Rosemary. Oh, uh, played by Mia Farrow. come now. <laughs> played by Mira Farrow is pregnant, and she begins to suspect that an evil cult wants to take her baby for use in their rituals. Right. Because it's casual. As, as you do. So this movie was referred to by Vanity Fair as literally the most cursed hit movie ever made. Ira Levin wrote the novel fearing backlash, and despite the fact that he was a Jewish Jewish atheist, feared he was committing blasphemy against God. (laughs) So he's like, I don't think he's real. But if he was, he'd be pissed about this. The backlash wasn't intense enough to cancel out how much of a blockbuster kind of book this would become, and it immediately turned into a film to capitalize on that success. Now, it was soon after filming that the curse apparently took hold. After filming? Mm-hmm. After filming began? Yeah, it's very wibbly-wobbly timey-wimey on this <laughs> one, but the first cursed soul was the film's composer, Christoph Komeda. Details of his death are scarce, but Polanski told it this way, which is the autumn after the film's release and still riding high on the breakthrough success of the movie and its score, which he had composed. 
37-year-old Cometa was roughhousing at a party when he fell off a rocky plateau. He was roughhousing? Yes, 37-year-old man just roughhousing at a party. Oh, I've met I've met many 37-year-old men. That part I have no trouble believing. I, I, I just um, want details. They having chicken fights back there? This is the most detail you'll find about this, is basically Polanski's retelling of it, because he loves giving interviews for someone who's in hiding. All right, well, he's never deceived anyone, so I, I, I'll take Roman <laughs> Polanski's word on this. Christoph Cometa soon after fell into a coma, which was weirdly the very same affliction Levin's witches used to kill uh, a suspicious friend of Rosemary's in the book. Mm -hmm. He remained in the coma for four months, but never regained consciousness and died the following year. Okay. Next was the film's producer, William Castle. Now, Castle was a producer of schlocky, gimmicky horror movies back in the 50s, around there, maybe a little even earlier. But this was his big hit in this time. He was sick with worry from hate mail he received constantly for producing the film from religious types and such. And in April 1969, his anxiety took physical form when he was suddenly stricken with severe kidney stones, which sounds oh, God. horrible. While he was delirious in the hospital, William Castle apparently hallucinated scenes from the film and was said to have yelled, Rosemary, for God's sake, drop the knife. Oh, boy. <laughs> he recovered, but just barely, and never made a Hollywood hit again. Now, I don't remember that line from the film. I think she, she when she's holding a knife at some point. I don't yeah. remember if it's said, but maybe he was hallucinating that he was in the scenes. Right, that's... It's wild. Mm -hmm. it's very specific and wild. Yeah. Perhaps the darkest incident happened around the director himself, Roman Polanski, one that most of us have heard about. No, not that one. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> At the time of filming Rosemary's Baby, Polanski was married to actress Sharon Tate. Oh, this is the one I was thinking about. Oh, I thought you were thinking of the, the bad touch. <laughs> <laughs> is that, I don't know what to say. Rowan got into trouble. He got into trouble. No, this is a different uh, incident. So he was married to Sharon Tate, and she had wanted the role of Rosemary, and I think he was kind of interested in giving it to her as well. But she yeah, was, he was. <laughs> she was turned down by Paramount for Mia Farrow. So instead, Sharon uh, made an uncredited appearance as an extra in the film. She spent a lot of time on set, so she was always around. She was? Oh, I was just assuming Polanski was probably banging Mia Farrow. No, Mia Farrow was banging Frank Sinatra. Oh, you don't want to step into that territory. Well, he was, this is vaguely unrelated, but one of the, the victims of the curse could be their relationship because he was basically like, I don't want you to make this movie. It's because he was Catholic Who, and all that Frank stuff. Frank was? Yeah, and she was like, I'm going to make this movie. and uh... Baby, it's evil. <laughs> hey. Don't knock your head off the fucking wall, you make that demon movie. <laughs> well, she did. Um, so by the late summer of 1969, the couple was expecting their first child any day, but their relationship would end in tragedy. On the night of August 8th, Tate and several of her friends, staying at her house while Polanski was overseas, were brutally murdered by cultists from cultists from Charles Manson's family. Yep. And uh, unlike what many people think, Charlie Manson was actually not there, as far as people can tell and all of the uh, accounts, you know, say, but... He right, did it was tex technically and Tex and a couple of the girls. Yeah, he did order the murders. Was the guy's name Tex Watson? Yes. Lansky only narrowly avoided this fate by being tied up with work in England. And uh yeah, that was one of the biggest stories of the sixties and the real end to the uh innocence of the hippie days, if you will. Well, sure, but it wasn't done by the devil or by Rosemary, it was, uh... Unless you, you think, as some might, that the devil possessed Charlie Manson and told him to kill everybody or have other people kill everybody. 
Oh, I think acid and a lifetime of abuse possessed Charlie Manson. Well, Sean, there are a couple of other strange coincidences around Rosemary's Baby. Most of the Beatles' White Album was written while they were on a meditation retreat in India, where Mia Farrow was also in attendance. And for my Beatles fans out there, her sister was named Prudence, and they wrote the song Dear Prudence while they were there about Prudence like refusing to come and eat dinner with them or something. She was holding herself up in her room. So, on so, the White Album... So that's a connection to the Tate murders. No, that's just a fun little thing. It's a connection to the Tate murders. Well, the connection from the White Album is Helter Skelter, which might have been written while they were at this retreat where Mia Farrow was. And this song was said to influence Manson's desire to start a race war beginning with the Tate murders. And the words Helter Skelter, which were misspelled in this situation, were written in blood on a wall at the crime scene. Right. And speaking of the Beatles, Sean, Mia Farrow's old friend, John Lennon, was assassinated in 1980 in front of the Dakota building in New York where he lived. The building where in 1967 exteriors were shot for Rosemary's Baby. <gasps> dun, dun, dun. <laughs> the curse even even got Lennon? Yes. He's, he's considered part of it. Oh, Mark David Chapman. <laughs> so, so that's Rosemary's Baby. Those are like the big points for that one. Wow, so just a trail of death followed this movie. Yeah, I mean, the points they hit, um, they're pretty, pretty intense. But I think movie number two might have a beat. Maybe not for uh, well-known crimes and deaths, uh, but just amount. (laughs) Okay. So The Omen is a film from 1976 that follows Gregory Peck, who's playing the American ambassador to England, as he slowly begins to believe his young son, Damien, is actually the Antichrist. Of course. Tale as old as time, once again. (laughs) The idea for the film came from an ad exec named Bob Munger, who dreamt up the concept of the Antichrist arriving in the form of an innocent-seeming child and just brought it to a film producer. This being the 70s, when apparently movies just got made. <laughs> yeah, 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 do it, do it, do it, do it. Munger's idea was turned into a screenplay, and The Omen was born. Now, this is interesting in that it's a film where the creators themselves kind of believe there was some sort of curse. Like, a lot of them will say that. Wow. So, first in the supposed canon of The Omen curse... Gregory Peck's son killed himself shortly before shooting began. Oh. And it's a a terrible tragedy, to be sure. But it must have been especially hard for Peck because not only did he just lose his son, he was about to star in a very dark film that was very much centered on a messed up father-son relationship. Yeah. How old was his kid? He was in his 20s, I think. Mm. So, understandably emotional, he set off on a flight for London when he was uh, due to film. And on that flight, the plane took a direct hit from lightning during a terrible storm while 20,000 feet in the air. And the engine literally caught on fire. Sure. Sure, they'll do that when they're hit by lightning. Sean, you know me. I am absolutely terrified of flying. This is my absolute freaking nightmare. It's your hell. Sean, it doesn't end there. On executive producer Mace Newfeld's flight over to England for filming, his plane hit an awful thunderstorm and was struck directly by lightning. Same storm? I mean, were they coming at the same time? No, different planes. Wow. So lightning literally struck twice. Well, I mean, on different planes. It's very, very uncommon for that to happen. Sure. Speaking of flying, Sean, because you know that is my passion. Mm -hmm. You're an aviatrix, (laughs) through and through. (laughs) Director Richard Donner, who also uh, directed such classics as Superman and Lethal Weapon, asked for some aerial shots to be filmed of London to use in The Omen. So the production rented a small plane, but soon before the shoot day, the rental company ask them if they'd be willing up to give that rental for the day due to a last minute booking request for a tour. But if they didn't mind just postponing a little bit, they'd get a huge discount later on their rescheduled rental. Great! 
Nothing at all could possibly go wrong with that. Of course not. They're filming on a budget. They're like, hell yes. Free money. Whenever. So the plane that was supposed to take a Donner and a few crew members left that day instead with a group of Chinese businessmen and hit a block of, and hit a flock of birds, lost power, and crashed into a car which contained the pilot's wife and their child. What? Driving away from having just dropped him off at the landing strip. That's insane. Everyone died. That's kind of, that guy is the opposite of Sully Sullenberger. Yes. He hit a bunch of, a bunch of geese hit his engine. And then instead of miraculously landing the plane in the Hudson River and saving everyone, he hit his own wife and kid with the plane. I don't think he hit it. The, uh, I mean, the, the plane completely had lost power by that point. So he had no control over it. So it's fucked up. Yeah, it's not great. But I guess uh, Satan just didn't know about the last minute change of plans. Took down the wrong plane. Well, that's the thing. Satan <laughs> didn't kill the, the movie producers. There's a lot of close calls in this story. For the scenes at the zoo, production filmed at Windsor Safari Park. The baboons in the scene went uh, absolutely apeshit, if you will, and went real method on attacking the car, which is what you see in the finished film. And it looks hellish. I mean, they are attacking the car. So, so it wasn't planned for them to react that way? It was like Not no as intensely. Looking for. I think they were supposed to be kind of agitated by Damien's presence, but they attacked the car. So another scene filmed that week, which didn't men- end up making the cut, was in the big cat's enclosure. The animal handler, handler for the safari park scenes was named uh, Sidney Bamford, and he's credited in the final film. It's Maria's father. Bamford was attacked and killed by one of the tigers the day the production left the park. Well, that's the day they left. See, so what if this isn't a curse? This is... Uh, uh, it was like, the, I think, the day after they filmed in that enclosure. Yeah, the, got... the omen was the only thing... The omen <laughs> being filmed there was the only thing saving him from that tiger. Starlee Remick, who played Damien's mother in the film, was getting so spooked by all of these incidents that she actually refused to film a stunt where she was to safely fall off a ledge onto the floor below. So the scene actually had to be filmed differently. This was the first time I found where superstition was literally changing how the movie was being made while it was still being filmed. Yeah, really. And also, I always kind of thought as an actor, you're usually, unless you're a big name, right? Aren't you kind of in a position of like, well, she was a, fucking do it, though. a pretty name person at that time. Producer Harvey Bernhard uh, developed a belief that the devil didn't want the film to be made while it was still being filmed. And he started wearing a cross every day and got a prayer chain going for the production back in America. Isn't this film pretty great branding for the devil? I mean, they definitely play into it. It's pretty awesome. The release. So his prayer chain might have helped because members of the cast and crew narrowly avoided being blown up by an IRA bomb set off at the Hilton Hotel they were staying at right after they left. Trying to boost spirits after this terrifying close call, Gregory Peck later invited nervous producers and the director to dinner at his favorite local restaurant named Scott's. And nothing at all bad happened. The IRA blew up the restaurant minutes before they got there for their reservation. This is like Final Destination. It's like lightning strikes twice. Well, how about bombing? Bombing strikes twice. And also lightning did two earlier. Yes. So... Fine. Okay. They made it. They finished filming. Cut, print, negatives being shipped back to America. What's one more plane trip, right? They've been going so well. Mm -hmm. Well, Lightning didn't strike again, Sean. I knew There were severe issues on the plane, and the flight ended up having to make a tense emergency landing in Newfoundland. I'm sorry, what? Mm Mm-hmm. Even without the lightning. But they finally got it to L.A., and it got edited and released. And it was released on June 6th, 1976. 666, if you will. Yes. But the release didn't stop the curse. Seasoned stuntman Alf Joint, which is a great British stuntman name, um, he had taken the place of Lee Remick's character as she fell out again of a hospital window to her death. Spoilers, sorry. <laughs> And it's a uh, 50 year old movie. I think it's okay. <laughs> God, time weird. 
So Alf was working on his next film where he again had to fall off a building because he's a stuntman, but as a professional, he knew how to fall to hit the large airbags that were positioned for him to safely land. No problem. They were like, I think they said they were like two giant airbags. And then everything went fine and it was cool. And he missed and he was severely injured and later on insisted it almost felt like he was pushed, but no one was near him at the time. Now, when he ended up in the hospital, he had the same image as Lee Remick's character did. He had, like, tubes up his nose, and the same arm was, like, in a hard cast. So, how far did he fall? Off a building. Uh, like, several stories. And just onto, like, pavement, basically? Yeah. yeah. He missed both, both of the airbags and hurt himself a lot. Yeah, it's a lot of bones. But maybe the most horrifying and strange incident and death to be tied to the omen probably Uh -uh. came a year later after filming Wrapped. John Richardson, the Oscar-winning special effects supervisor on the production, was driving in Holland during his next film shoot with his assistant, Liz Moore. Holland, Netherlands? Yes. Uh, And... The car was involved in a head-on collision where Moore, who was sitting in the passenger seat, was beheaded. Wow. By what? Uh, I think think it was a death-proof tire of the oncoming car situation. Oh, my God. When Richardson came to, the first thing he saw um, next to the car was an old milepost with a marker 66.6 kilometers. (laughs) Come on! And the road was on the way to a town named Omen. Come on, Satan. O-M-M-E-N. It's a little on the nose. You want on the nose, Sean? An additional creepy coincidence about this accident is that Richardson had designed the death scene of the character Jennings in The Omen, a character who was famously brutally decapitated. Yeah. Not by a car tire. No, by a pane of glass, but it flew off of a car. Mm -hmm. About the incident, Richardson said, you can't dwell on something like that when it happens to you, because if you do, I'm sure you'll end up going mad. Wow. So that's the omen. Got an H.P. Lovecraft protagonist. I guess. He's still popping, apparently. Just walking around hollow eyes. I would. Uh, doing stuntman things. Doing what things? What is he? He was a special effects supervisor. Just, just walking around, hollow eyes, supervising special effects. As you do. As you do. Um, all right, so you've got two more of these movies to get into, right? Mm-hmm. Are, are these stories as as wild as the first two? Yes. Okay, well, I can't wait to get into them, and we will um, right after a break. See you guys in a minute. Welcome back. We were just getting into some tales of on-set horror from potentially cursed films. Um, Carrie, you have two more of these for us, right? Yeah. The next is a another horror classic, which is Poltergeist from 1982. Sure. Who doesn't love Poltergeist? <laughs> the title is pretty self-explanatory. A family is harassed by a supernatural entity. Hijinks ensue. <laughs> Now, this film is one where the legend of the curse is almost as known as the plot of the film itself. The curse here also supposedly haunts the whole trilogy. So we'll be skipping around here from the most maybe coincidental to most chilling or unexplainable. Really? I I didn't realize there were uh, uh, creepy happenings around all three. All of them. You son of a bitch, you left the bodies and you only moved the headstones! You only moved the headstones! Art imitated life on the set of Poltergeist, or maybe life imitated the art. Wait, no. (laughs) In the film, the backyard pool is overtaken by a bunch of skeletons coming out of the ground, which is the root of the supernatural phenomena, because the home had been built over a burying ground with the bodies still underneath. Right. It's long been legend that real human skeletons were used for this scene, but that is actually true. Oh, no. Crazily enough, it was apparently the budget-conscious way to have a bunch of skeletons in a movie. Wait, it's cheaper to get real skeletons? That's what I think the special effects or set designer um, 
said in the documentary Cursed Films, he said it was cheaper than to have someone make them. Well, I guess you've already got the bones there, but, but you would think... And the star of the film said that Spielberg had insisted, now he didn't direct this, but he don't think he directed it, and he had insisted on the real skeletons because they looked the most realistic. Sure, Sp and Spielberg only goes for photorealism. You've seen Jaws. <laughs> hey, when the shark shows up, he looks good. Some people believe that the fact that real skeletons were used for the scene contributed to a curse. But it wasn't actually the first movie to do so, because human skeletons had been used for filmmaking purposes for years, including in the original House on Haunted Hill and in Frankenstein. Wow. So those were real. Actor Oliver Robbins, who played the brother in the first two Poltergeist films, is still alive and well. He's fine. But he did have a pretty scary accident on the set of the first film. Like a... a um omen style um final destination-esque uh, uh, uh mouse trap death kind of because if you remember a creepy clown doll strangles his character in one scene mm -hmm. and it was kind of rigged to safely look like it was doing so to robbins but the mechanism malfunctioned and he was getting actually strangled by this clown doll it was like uncontrollable and they were basically all around him doing the whole, like, wow, he's giving a great performance kind of thing. And then they realize, oh, he can't breathe. This isn't a performance. <laughs> yeah. So if they hadn't pried the doll off in time, he may have been seriously injured. Did they use, so, you know, you know, Ridley Scott used, um, didn't tell any of the actors that the chest burster was going to come out in Alien. Mm -hmm. And then like, that's, you see like the real terror around their face. You're asking if this is some sort of method trick? Yes. He was a child, so I don't think they would have actually strangled the child just for the reaction. Oh, no, sorry. I'm just asking. I'm not asking if they did that on purpose. Uh, only if they used that take in the film. Oh, absolutely. And we'll uh, encounter this again. That take is always used. <laughs> Actor Will Sampson, who is in Poltergeist 2, asked for permission to perform an exorcism on the set after hours. As a shaman himself, he felt bad energy from the film and wanted to rid it of his demons. But he died less than a year later from kidney failure and malnutrition at the age of 53. Oh, he sucked up all those demons into his kidneys? Some people say that it was because he exercised the set that he got sick and died. See, this is what you got to be careful when you run around saging every new room we walk into. <laughs> Just where we live. Julian Beck, the actor who played the creepy cult leader in the same film, who you may know for his catchphrase, you're going to die, <laughs> died of stomach cancer during production. Oh, uh, geez. Who told him? Mm, with some of his lines having to be ADR'd by another actor. Unsettlingly, to include Beck's striking appearance for Poltergeist 3, his literal, actual death mask was used to create prosthetics for the body actor who would end up taking up that role. Oh, the most shocking thing about that is that they still make death masks? That's a thing? Well, he was kind of this famous guy in the theater scene, so I feel like he probably had some hipster friend do it, but oof. Dominique Dunn starred in the first Poltergeist as the older sister in the family, the brunette. Dominique was the daughter of Dominic Dunn, a famous crime writer for Vanity Fair. And if you like true crime, his work is awesome. He did a bunch of OJ stuff at the time, so you should check it out. And she's also sister of Griffin Dunn, one of the stars of An American Werewolf in London. He's like the friend that ends up haunting him for the rest of the movie. Spoiler alert again. Gotcha. And their other um, brother is Brooks and Dunn, the country <laughs> duo from the 90s, right? Brooks and yes. <laughs> Dominique was just starting out in Hollywood when she landed Poltergeist, and she was poised to jumpstart a career. But unfortunately, she was in an abusive relationship with a guy named John Sweeney, who was a real piece of shit who was also uh, coincidentally the sous chef for celebrity cook Wolfgang Puck. Oh. <laughs> Just random connection there. Sure. After John beat her up yet again, Dominique finally was able to cut off the relationship for good. But that pissed off Sweeney, and he showed up at her home soon after and strangled her nearly to death. She remained in a coma for about five days, but was taken off of life support. And he only ended up getting two and a half years in prison. But she survived. No, she was taken off life support. Oh. Oh, I thought, like, because 
No. Because she didn't need it anymore. Oh. Yeah. Mm. And uh, her father, Dominic, ended up writing about the trial and uh, the sentencing for Vanity Fair. So that's some heart-wrenching true crime work as well. Gosh. Now, one of the saddest deaths associated with Poltergeist is likely also the biggest claim to a curse this movie has. It's what everyone brings up. Mm -hmm. And that's the untimely passing of Heather O'Rourke, who played the cherubic little girl Carol Ann in all three films. Yep. I think she was one of the only people to be in all three. Um, the medium, Zelda Rubenstein, she was also in them. But she was like, she was the stalwart. She was the face of the franchise. She was a preternaturally intelligent kid who was on her way to having a life in film. And she had even told her Poltergeist 3 director that she wanted to study his technique because she was going to be a director herself when she grew up. She's a really cute kid. She had been discovered by Steven Spielberg himself while she was visiting MGM Studios and then was promptly cast in Poltergeist. Heather had been ill since before production began on Poltergeist 3 and was diagnosed as having Crohn's disease. So she started receiving treatments, including steroids, which is why she kind of looked like she has chipmunk cheeks in the third movie. Mm. Mm -hmm. But it turned out she didn't have Crohn's disease. She passed away at the age of 12 while production was still ongoing for Poltergeist 3 due to a birth defect that had created an abscess in her intestine. Ugh. This defect had been completely missed by doctors, and her, mo her mother ended up filing a wrongful death suit against the hospital. Director Gary Sherman was heartbroken by O'Rourke's death, saying, quote, We decided the film's over. I can't go back into the cutting room or watch this film with this dead 11-year-old in it. Wow. Unfortunately, they still had to, f had to film an ending, and the studios wouldn't let Sherman abandon the project. So he had to shoot more scenes featuring a double as Carol Ann. He said of the shoot, quote, that was the creepiest thing I've ever gone through in my life. Having this little girl dressed up as Heather, keeping her face away from camera. None of us wanted to be, none of us wanted this film to be released, but it was. And Poltergeist 3 was dedicated to Heather O'Rourke. Did anything bad happen after that? No, but they never made any more movies. Okay, so here's the thing. I feel like that's when a curse should kick in because like, you know, you, this little girl died and then you callously insisted on like forcing everyone <laughs> through the production and you released the picture. Now all the studio executives should be haunted. It, it shouldn't <laughs> Maybe be. Maybe they were. Maybe they were. And no one uh, con connected the two things. <laughs> um, that's a very sad story. Yeah, it's pretty rough. I don't know if it's evidence for a curse. She had it was a birth defect. She'd had it since uh, conservatively ten years before she was in the first movie. Yeah, but you know she had been brought to a lot of doctors trying to diagnose whatever was going on with her, and they just completely missed it. People point to that as some sort of curse thing. Man, yeah, look at this, oh doctor! It's a it's a demon. We never ran the demon test. <laughs> exactly. Speaking of the demon test, we have the granddaddy of them all for our last film, which is The Exorcist. Uh, demon test. The demon test was the working title for The Exorcist. Isn't that right? <laughs> I tried to segue, Sean. Now, is it the scariest movie of all time? I have a theory on this, and I think I've shared this with you. I think in order for... The Exorcist, to scare you, you have to be old enough to be frightened of the actual devil. You also have to believe in the actual devil, too. Yeah. And God and all that. But that's an age thing, too. Yeah. I think it depends on um, how connected you are to spirituality and things like that, whether you find it frightening. But a lot of people think it's the scariest movie ever, and that includes people our age. The Exorcist is basically the OG demon possession movie centered around a 12-year-old girl named Regan, played by Linda Blair, who plays the most dangerous version of fuck around and find out ever <laughs> when she conjures up a malicious spirit with a Ouija board and ends up possessed by a demon named Pazuzu. Mm -hmm. A pair of priests are eventually brought in to perform an exorcism on the child, but not before getting barfed on and seeing her head do a full 360. The Exorcist is loosely based on a true life event, which original author novel William Peter Blatty saw recounted in a newspaper article. So some people say that's where this starts is with the actual real event. 
but the film itself was plagued by mishaps from the very beginning. The sets caught fire during the night, and no one was injured, but they lost most of the sets entirely, except, of course... Craft services. Reagan's room, the domain of Pazuzu in the film. Star Max von Zito, who played one of the priests, his brother died the first day of filming. Oh, Max. And a special effects supervisor died during production, as did a set security guard. Similarly to Oliver Robbins during the Poltergeist shoot, Linda Blair was hurt during a take. How did those guys die? I could not find that. (sighs) So she was laced into an apparatus that was yanked around to give the appearance of uncontrolled possession. And you see that in the movie. She's like flailing around on the bed. But the laces came loose for one take and she ended up fracturing her lower spine. (gasps) Now, as we mentioned before, Sean... Do you think this was the footage they used in the movie because it was real? It's always the take they used. Mm -hmm. Poor Linda Blair was deeply traumatized by the film and its aftermath with the studio having to get bodyguards for her because of death death threats by people actually thinking she was a demon. In the movie, she's a little girl who's taken over by a demon. And at the end, the demon's out of her. Yeah, well, I think most of the people that were doing this didn't see the movie one of those things people would run or scream when they saw her and she kind of had a really tough time growing up after that despite the consolation being that she was nominated for an oscar for her role if you don't take home the statue it's no consolation (laughs) baby she she didn't have the only harness scene that went wrong though at one point regan slaps her mother who then flies across the room which was achieved by actress Ellen Burstyn being pulled while being while also having been locked into a harness. Uh, crouching tiger, hidden dragon style. <laughs> mm-hmm. But one pull was especially vicious, and Burstyn received a permanent spinal inju- injury that she says she lives with to this day. This footage was also the cut that we see in the final film. So she hits the wall and screams. That's her getting a permanent spinal injury. Excellent. I mean, listen, she sacrificed for the art. You can't let that sacrifice go in vain. Mm-hmm. Got to use that take. Exactly. There are so many issues surrounding the production that a Washington, D.C. Jesuit priest, Thomas M. King, was asked to come in and bless the set. Later, televangelist Billy Graham, known for his reasoned and level-headed view on things, <laughs> stated, quote, there is a power of evil in the film, in the fabric of the film itself. I didn't have the heart to tell him that film is not made of fabric, but, you know, whatever. <laughs> it's called celluloid, baby. Two actors who char- whose characters actually died in the film, Jack McGowan and Vasiliki Maliaros, died in real life during post-production. McGowan was only 54 at the time and died from complications resulting from a flu caught during a London pandemic. That was going on at the time. Searingly relevant. Mm-hmm. But the curse's hold didn't loosen after release, Sean. The film notoriously caused people at screenings to be sick or pass out. And during the film's premiere in Rome, a storm surged around the theater as the audience filed inside. And shortly after the film began playing, a giant 400-year-old cross on top of a nearby church was struck by lightning, causing it to fall into the plaza below. Where was this? Rome. Now imagine you're some Italian uh, teenager, college student going out to see The Omen. You've got a head full of acid. The Exorcist. Uh, you're going out to see uh, The Exorcist. Mm-hmm. You've got a head full of acid. You're out there with your buddies. And that's happened. You come out of the theater. Uh, oh, fr- they heard it happen. Freaked already. And then here's the uh, <laughs> flaming cross. It happened during um, the film. And- I'm sorry, man. <laughs> I'm sorry I watched it. Many people inside claimed at the time to hear a horrific, almost demonic cry coming from outside once the film started rolling. Oh, I think I pissed myself, man! (laughs) Now, the funniest thing about the people passing out and everything is if you look at old interviews, they'll be usually, like, freaked out young women being like, I passed out ten minutes in. And if you remember, nothing really happens for, like, the first half an hour. Right. But they're like, I couldn't even get to half an hour in. It's like, what were you afraid of? The archaeology? What's happening? I think it was the marketing, probably. I think that's the the terrifying element here. They just couldn't handle themselves. Now, 
Some movies have tragedy associated with them. Some have tragedies occur on set. But how many have actual convicted murderers in their casts? Uh, are you going to tell me? I will. Well, I don't know how many. I know, but I know about this one. I know three Naked Gun films. <laughs> he wasn't convicted. That's why I said convicted, Sean. He's been convicted of other things, though. Not of murder. <sighs> A harrowing scene involving medical tests run on Regan to try and find out what was ailing her was filmed at the NYU Radiology Department in New York. Doctors at NYU Today still credit the angiogram scene as one of the most real life, most lifelike depictions of a medical procedure in film. And it's rough. Real people that worked in the department were used as the medical personnel in the scene. So that helped contribute to the intensely realistic feel. One of those people was a young radiology technician named Paul Bateson, who you can see in the final film. He's in a couple of shots. He has a couple of lines. He was said to be quiet, but very nice to his patients. But Addison Verrill wasn't a patient. Um. Verrill, a film reporter for a variety magazine, was found dead in his Greenwich Village apartment in 1977, four years after The Exorcist release. Reporter Arthur Bell covered the murder in The Village Voice. And soon after publication, he received a call from an anonymous man saying he killed Verrill after a hookup out of his own anger and desperation due to his alcoholism and fear of rejection. Wow. Bell reported the call and received police protection promptly with detectives telling him to wait for another call, which came right after that uh, that evening. This time, the caller pinned the crime on Paul Bateson. Bateson was arrested and identified as the caller and gave the same statement to police that he had just given freely to Arthur Bell. However, during trial, Bateson retracted his confession, insisting he had been drunk when he gave it. It wasn't real. Yeah, but he was also drunk when he killed the guy. (laughs) Yeah. The prosecution attempted to connect Bateson to the unsolved murders of six other men who were also found dismembered between 1975 and 77, also in Greenwich Village. Oh my gosh. The judge ultimately decided that the six other murders were too ephemeral to have any connection to this case, but Bateson was found guilty of Verrill's murder and sentenced to a minimum of 20 years in prison. Speaking to a podcast for The Hollywood Reporter in 2018, director William Friedkin discussed the impact Bateson had on him. Quote, I called his lawyer and told him who I was and asked him, could I visit with Paul? His lawyer said, okay. He was at Rikers Island. He was very cheerful. He said, I remember killing this one guy. I cut him up and I had, I put his body parts in a plastic bag and threw it in the East River. So. Wait, separate. That's a, that's not the same murder. Well, that's what he said. He's like, well, he was found in his apartment. Who's this guy you're talking about? This discussion with Bateson would form the inspiration for Friedkin's next movie. I think the I know. Infamous Cruising, starring Al Pacino. Ah, yes. Yes. Bateson himself was released from prison in 2003, and a reporter for Esquire couldn't find any trace of him other than a previous address in Freeport, New York, and no death certificate either. So, Paul Bateson, murderer and sometime film actor, is still out there. And he's still hanging out somewhere. Oh, he's a hundred percent murdering under a different identity. Maybe that's the scariest part of all, Sean. How many... That makes me want to just go into all those other murders he was accused of and figure out whether this guy's a serial killer. Sounds like another episode to me. Oh. (laughs) Oh, tis a consummation devoutly to be wished. Well, putting a pin in that for now... What do you think? Do you think these films were in any way cursed, especially due to their content, which had to do with, a lot of the times, religion, spirituality, demons, ghosts? Well, what's the premise here? Like, who's getting mad? I assume the god the god or the devil uh, <laughs> I think are at getting least mad. three out of four is, quote-unquote, the devil. Right, so. but again, these movies seem like good marketing for that guy. <sighs> Yeah, for a certain type, I guess. I did see in the Omen documentary that I watched um, 
someone who was either a religious fella or a Satanist, something like that. He said something to the effect of the devil likes to move around in secret and he doesn't like when his spots blown up in so many words. So, well, in that case, why are the same people getting mad at the movies coming out? Anything that the, the enemy of my enemy, right? I didn't say it made sense, Sean. <laughs> Anyway, I think I think people die sometimes, and it's sad most of the time. Yeah. I'm most intrigued by the Omen ones, because even if those are all coincidences, um, those are some pretty wild coincidences, like in real life, not even related to a movie set or anything. If one person knew people whose planes were <laughs> both hit by lightning and bombings both happened right before they were there and the, the plane a beheading crashing happened on, to the guy who made a beheading happen in a movie like the, those are some pretty crazy things the plane crashing on takeoff and hitting the pilot's wife and son I in mean, a car i mean that that itself is just one horrifying cursed coincidence not even related to all of these that problems. is a a dark miracle yeah so that's the one that's most interesting to me but um do i think that the devil had it out for these film sets. Mm, it's fun to, to, to get all spooky about it and, and make every part of it um, really freaky and scary. But honestly, as someone who's been on set myself, the scariest thing is um, no nearby toilets, usually. No Red Bull. No coffee. Not having hand warmers in the winter. <laughs> <laughs> We're not usually worried about the devil. We're usually worried about overtime permits, <laughs> SAG, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. So, but it's fun to, it's fun to think spooky about these things. Uh, yeah, it always is. And this is part one of two, right, Caroline? You're, uh, you've, you've got something different for us next week. Yeah. So no more cursed films because these are the cream of the crop, baby. But next week is about haunted Hollywood. So all things spooky and ghostly having to do with Hollywood, past and modern. I mean, but not present, obviously, because these are ghosts. Well, so we well, got Marilyn Monroe. We got Rudy Valentino. We got some fun people just uh, floating around there. Fantastic. Sounds like a lot of uh, sadness and death on next week's episode as well. Yes, but I think it'll be a little more um, upbeat because it doesn't really involve dying children and stuff well i'll look forward to our part two of our discussion <laughs> on hollywood but um for now let's take another break and then uh, come back with a new segment what do you say absolutely woof woof it's time for pose cryptid corner oh he's so excited <laughs> Now, unfortunately, this story isn't going to be about actual Bigfoots, big feet. I think it's Bigfoots. But rather Bigfoot statues. So, Coast to Coast AM is reporting on a troubling recent trend, as they call it, <laughs> of petty thieves stealing Bigfoot statues from houses and museums across America. How big is a statue before it stops being petty theft? I think it's Four and above. Four is four? Yeah. Four any what? any four feet. For petty theft? <laughs> I don't know. Why did you answer me so seriously? <laughs> <laughs> just for the, just for the listener, there was no smile, there was no twinkle in her eye. I no, said, I, I, I said in jest, how big is a statue before it's not petty theft? And Caroline, my wife, looked into my eyes and said, four. <laughs> because that's where these these uh, thefts start. They start at four feet. <laughs> anyway. So no statues smaller than four feet have been taken? Not that I saw. Not that it was remarked upon. Okay. In 2019, a six-foot-tall Bigfoot statue was stolen from outside the offices of a landscaping company. Not Four Seasons Total Landscaping. 
But this wasn't even the first report of a Bigfoot to be stolen in the last decade or even the last couple of years. There were seven other cases in 2019 alone. In the U.S.? Yes. In September. I guess there's probably not a statue of a, book, a Bigfoot <laughs> anywhere else in the U.S. or anywhere else except the U.S. In September of this year, a sheet metal Sasquatch was swiped from a private residence's yard in Minnesota. Bastards. And Bring me back <laughs> my Sasquatch! I know, I'd be so pissed off. Now Bigfoot bandits have hit the Bigfoot Discovery Museum in California. At some point on Monday afternoon, thieves made off with a Sasquatch statue that stood at four feet tall, <laughs> which is why I started it there, at the doorway to the museum. Man, the Bridgeport Discovery Museum just has like... You know, a room that's a little quieter than normal and, you know, other fun science. Planetarium. A planetarium, maybe. Yeah, I want uh, a Bigfoot museum. Yeah, the Bigfoot Discovery Museum sounds like more fun. Fortunately, unlike in many similar cases where the Bigfoot statue is never recovered, because that usually happens, this particular piece wound up being discovered on Friday morning by the nearby Scotts Valley Police Department. According to the department's Facebook post, their officers responded to reports of a quote, suspicious figure lurking alongside a road, and when they arrived on the scene, discovered the Bigfoot statue. And I really love the fact that someone mistook a Bigfoot for just a run-of-the-mill suspicious <laughs> figure. He called right. it in. That guy's big and hairy, and he hasn't moved in a few minutes. I'm going to call this in. <laughs> the police department said the statue was a little banged up, but will be returned to its rightful place at the Bigfoot Discovery Museum. So at least for this ineffable effigy, we have an answer and a happy ending. They said it's a little it's a little banged up. What are they commenting on whether it can return in the fourth quarter? <laughs> exactly. Oh, Bigfoot. Do you think he'd be a good football player? This this feels like a George Norrie question. It, 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 Do you think a Bigfoot would be a good football now, player? Now, if a Bigfoot was on the gridiron, what uh, what position do you suppose he would play? Kicker. Oh. I'm good. Well, yeah, those big feet. But I, I think you're wasting – you don't hide Bigfoot's light under a bushel. I think you want him right up there on the offensive line making a hole for you. Has there ever been someone who was a kicker and Oh, or a tight else? end. I mean, Rob Gronkowski didn't have to be a great football player. He just had to be a huge freak, right? Yeah, I, I feel like he probably has a lot of similarities to Bigfoot. Rob Gronkowski is also a, a, a great football player. But you, you, you get what I'm saying. Well, Sean, what do you think? Are all of these thefts connected? Is there some sort of Bigfoot statue thievery cabal out there? I'm sorry. I, I, now all I can think about is a Wendigo just falling over the end zone with a, with, with a ball in his hands. <laughs> a Yeti being a snowboarder. Oh, man, this is like Air Bud. Oh, no, I want to keep him on the gridiron. I, I want to see a whole football team of, of Bigfoots and Bigfoot adjacents. <sighs> God, only in our lifetime, I would, I would hope. That's it for this episode of Ain't It Scary with Sean and Carrie. Like us on Facebook and follow us on Twitter and Instagram at Ain't It Scary. And check out our website at ain'titscary.com. And please subscribe to the show and throw us a five-star review on iTunes. We'll be forever grateful. See you next Thursday. Yep, show created by Sean and Carrie McCabe, music by Kyle Ryan. This has been a production of Longboy Media.